Can't you guys see that? Hmm. Why can't you see that? Let me do that. Okay, cool. Uh, that. Okay, cool. All right, everybody. So let's uh, let's get going. Hope everybody had a good uh, turkey day and a, and a restful um, few days off, and everybody's healthy and all that good stuff. Um, <clears throat> Uh, we'll talk about our surveys and, and get some of the specifics um, in a bit, but I wanted to uh, start off with um, trying to at least not, we're not done, but provide a sort of summary, um, concluding context for our seafood surveys um, as one example of a bunch of hopeful, positive things to finish up with today's last formal lecture day of the semester. Um, and you know, sometimes we talk about challenges. We have a lot of challenges here in coastal and marine management. Um, no shortage of problems, lots of scary things, some very serious things. But um, it is, I think you have seen over the semester, you have seen um, positive examples. You have seen new ideas and, and ways we can effectively go forward. And I would say, that um, one of the reasons we've crafted this exercise for you, and we've done it over the years, is because it really is um, uh, a, a nice example of something positive that you all can do right now, right? Whether you have a boat, don't have a boat, live at the coast, don't live at the coast, um, this is really a, a, a engagement with resources that it is in anybody's wheelhouse. Um, we talked about before the importance of life history stages, the effect of different sizes, et cetera, and the historic change in fisheries. And <clears throat> as we said last time, right, our overall, our overall motivation here is, is what seafood is, is being sold and, and can people that just walk off the street, can they um, make a more informed decision with the, the offerings at that particular establishment that you're um, looking at? Obviously, there's other, other questions we're looking at, but th th those, are the, those are the big mile high ones. Um, ultimately, what we're talking about here is trying to craft a more healthy, vibrant, verdant ocean. Let me turn these lights down. Uh, a more healthy, uh, you know, diverse ocean is what we're searching for. And this picture here is from Europe. This is some uh, uh, one type of new fish pens that are being evaluated for use in um, fish farming and uh, production of seafood by uh, AmeriCulture means. And uh, jumping off from this paper uh, last year by a, a large group of, of fishery scientists, um, they think it is possible that we can have an increasingly healthy, increasingly diverse ocean, right? We have huge challenges. We've heard about heat waves, right? The blob. We've heard about a sea level rise and all these, all these other challenges that are truly global in scale. Fisheries also a global in scale problem. But nevertheless, uh, uh, some very tangible examples of how we can um, do better. Uh, first and foremost, we can continue to improve fishery management. As we talked about last week in, in lab, um, you know, we have a lot of stocks that are problematic. We have a lot of stocks that are maximally fished and or overfished, right? And that's, and we've been doing that as a species for thousands of years, right? So we've, we have a history of depleting populations, whether it's the Polynesians arriving to Hawaii, the Europeans get in North America, you know, we, we can pick whatever the example, but it seems to be a general aspect of our society. Um, and so, so uh, we can do better. We, we, we have gotten some clues as to how to do better with things like marine protected areas, et cetera. 
Um, uh, so fishery management in general. And then secondly, specifically improve things related to mariculture, especially in places like California, right? Again, uh, the, the fact that I've, I've used a couple times because it just seems so, so right on the head with our um, Central Coast trip was 11 abalone production facilities across the state um, about 10, 15 years ago, and now we have three. Right, so, so that's not um, that's not just by accident. It it is quite difficult to start up a mariculture business here in 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 the U.S. in general, but especially California, and to keep it going and to have it you know promptly uh, 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 properly um, supported with say if we're bringing in seawater or or food or uh, kelp or whatever it is we need. So we really do need some better policy support for this. Um, this isn't just related to, to seafood, but, but um, th that's a big part of it. Next, as also as we touched on briefly in lab last week, um, a key thing as we continue to, to push more protein coming from cultured sources, um, and because we, we, as we've talked about, we Americans in particular, and, 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 and Japanese and Europeans are sort of the largest consumers of seafood around the globe. We really like the, um, the predatory fish, right? The omnivorous fish. And so um, we, we've made some advances, but we need a lot more in terms of the feed, in terms of the food we're giving to these critters that we're not depleting wild stocks to turn into fish meal to feed to them, right? So, so still need lots of improvements in that context. Um, and then uh, the last one uh, that these guys suggest in this paper is to shift consumer demand away from the most problematic stocks. And that's exactly what you guys are doing with your seafood survey, right? So one, as we've mentioned, one, we're collecting data and just sort of getting the sense of what the lay of the land is here in Southern California, coastal Southern California. And that's a useful exercise in and of itself. But also uh, the very act of you saying, right? Hey, so how many people ask about this? And then when you're looking at that menu or that or that item on the shelf or whatever, and you're saying like, hey, what species is this, right? That's providing a signal to the, the owner, the proprietor, the workers, whoever, that this is something that people care about, right? Um, if it's just you, probably not going to make a huge, big, huge dent. But if it's you and somebody else next week and somebody else the week after and somebody else the week after the next, say, staff meeting or next what, what have you meeting, um, you know, people will uh, say, well, maybe we could, you know, think about getting, figuring out where the, what this fish actually is, instead of just saying unknown fish from this box that we get delivered every week or whatever, right? So that, that the very fact of asking questions um, is, uh, uh, to some extent, helping to, to push us towards more, push us away from more problematic stocks into more, um, more positive and, and healthy stocks. Um, okay, uh, why eat seafood to begin with? We touched uh, on this a little bit last week in class, but I wanted to make sure we went over a little more detail. So uh, seafood is the healthiest protein around um, uh, in terms of, uh, definitely in terms of animal proteins, but also in general, just in terms of protein to calorie ratio. So seafood is really, really good, uh, or, or at least seafood can be really, really good. Um, the other uh, reason why um, seafood is something we should, um, I would argue that we should be concerned with and, and, and working on um, increasing better, safer, healthier supplies of this food item is that they also tend to have a concentration of relatively rare micronutrients and, and other things that uh, aren't found in other proteins. So for example, uh, there's trace things like selenium that we need, but then the, the biggest one that gets the most attention are the omega-3 fatty acids. So these are essential, th th these are key parts of our building blocks. If you remember back to your intro bio class, um, when we talked about tissues and all this and that, um, a lot of this, oh, these omega-3s, so firstly, we don't make those. You and I can't make them, so we have to get them from eating um, other, consuming something outside of our body, right? And that those materials, in particular, these three fatty acids, which are the most, uh, DHA, DHA is the most um, 
I would say the, the, the biggest one, but they're all pretty important. Um, and uh, we use that when, when our, our, you know, our cells are building tissues and, and integuments and that kind of stuff, um, as well as in other uh, physiological processes. And um, generally speaking, most of our seafood has a much lower environmental impact and, a lo and, and definitely a lower carbon footprint or what we call fin print um, than many other sources of, um, certainly of meat and, and many other sources of, of food in general, actually. Um, so we talk about land versus ocean provisioning. Um, it, it should be obvious, but just to be clear, our wild caught fisheries, our wild caught seafood doesn't need any land, right? So if we're just going out, throwing a hook in the water, picking up the critter, we might well be over harvesting that population, let's say that's a possible, that's a worry. But as far as the actual impact of the, of the getting of the, the animal, it's relatively minimal. So we're not using fertilizers, we're not transforming the landscape unless we're doing bottom trawling uh, in sen around sensitive habitat, which, is, which can happen. But by and large, that's, that's not what's going on. Um, and if we talk about, uh, the, so similar to our conversations about terrestrial mining versus deep sea mining, right? Um, unfortunately, we're not in the place where we can just say, hey, let's not do that at all, right? We have billions of mouths that need to be fed every day, right? And so we need to get food from somewhere. And the reality is that terrestrial food and, and food related uh, crop production is, is either the largest or, or, or tied or very close to one of the largest um, drivers of ecological fragmentation and outright destruction. So th right now, 36% of all terrestrial landscapes across the planet are used for food production for you and I. That could be either um, crop lands, uh, it could be um, orchards, that could be uh, gr great pastures for, for grazing cattle and things. Um, and if we look at the land that's potentially usable for, um, for agriculture, like theoretically, like if we just sort of got rid of everything else and just made it pure, pure ag, um, we're already using more than half of that possible land uh, right now. <clears throat> or I think these facts came from a 2016 paper, I think. So, so um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a lot. And then importantly, the vast majority of potable water, surface potable water um, is going to support agriculture directly or indirectly. So, so huge um, consequences from our terrestrial food production uh, systems. Um, generally speaking, the CO2 emissions are similar to, and in some cases better than plants. So, so better than a plant-based diet. Um, we talked a little, we touched a little bit on um, seaspiracy in, in lab last week and, and what I believe are the silly, much of the silly claims and ridiculous factoids and the gotcha stuff for the sake of gotcha and the racist stuff and all that jazz. But, but um, uh, that was really produced by folks that have a, a particular political agenda that wants you to eat um, or that want, the, want to convert more people to a vegan-based diet. And, you know, if you guys want to do a vegan-based diet, awesome, knock you out. But um, it's not necessarily the case that the lowest carbon footprint is a vegan diet. And so um, we can see that here. So this is a paper from 2018, Hillborn et al., and um, might be a little hard to see those figures, so I blew them up a little bit right here. Um, <clears throat> and so what we're looking at here are um, uh, uh, the emissions associated with um, different uh, uh, food production or different, different food crops. So um, if you're in the back and you can't read it right here, we have uh, carp, um, uh, uh, freshwater fish, that um, uh, several species of which are, are um, cultivated in a, a pretty uh, cool approach that, that was um, piloted in uh, China that really has, uh, so for example, flooded rice paddies. You can have, for example, three different um, food guilds of carp. You have sort of like the guys that graze on the bottom, sort of folk guys that are 
feeding on the middle of the water column. And then some of these guys that are feeding on sort of insects and stuff at the top of the water. So it can actually get pretty sophisticated, but suffice to say, so that's carp, catfish, another very um, uh, commonly grown um, uh, fish, especially in places like the South, Southern US. Uh, mollusks, salmon, shrimp, tilapia. We actually haven't talked about tilapia in here. I, that's, that's probably my bad, but so, um, so maybe want to give me a quick uh, 30 second overview of what they know about tilapia. Yeah, Jack. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, they can be problematic if they get out. Um, mostly the cultivation is not in, in open water, but they're in small ponds and pools and, and things of that nature. Um, they have a really wide range, uh, a wide salinity tolerance range so that you can grow them in, in you know, brackish water, sort of saltier water, fresher water. They're, they're, they're pretty amazingly robust. Um, and so you'll find places in, say like the Philippines and Southeast Asia where they're growing them in like a 55 gallon drum kind of thing. So they're, they're pretty, um, they're pretty hardy critters. Um, and they're, they're uh, a huge, um, they, they've grown tremendously in the last 15 years in terms of global uh, aquaculture production. Um, and you can get these now in many of our restaurants. So if you guys go out to dinner, um, it's, it's fairly common to see tilapia. Has anybody found them yet in their surveys? I mean, I've never seen any. Well, I, yeah, I didn't see any in my survey, but there's a place in Oxnard where you can buy the fish, the sloppy, and they have you with the street. Oh, cool. Yeah. Ooh, or food market or something? Yeah, I, I, I've seen it many places, actually. Yeah, yeah Jack. I mean, uh, Kurt. I heard something like the sloppy is the only fish that can survive in the salt and sea. Ooh. Is that true? I don't know if any fish can survive in the salt and sea. <laughs> So it's pretty sketch. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have I'll I'll look it up and get back to you guys for lab this week. I I I've not heard that. That seems to me a, a, a statement of this place is so crazy. Only and then like fill in the blank. Keith Richards could live there, right? You know that that kind of thing. But um, but I I do not know of any tilapia living in the Salton Sea. But um, I think again that probably came from the fact that they have such a wide tolerance uh, that they can handle skanky nasty horrible areas that's probably where that's coming from i'll, I'll look it up I'll, I'll i'll explore i'll get back to you guys um okay and then as we go on from the left there keep going then we get into more of the terrestrial um uh uh meats and, and animal products so beef chicken eggs lamb uh milk and, and this is this is co2 emissions and this is the embodied energy to to produce them so they're obviously, you know, pretty, pretty related. Um, uh, milk, pork, and then we get into plants. So corn, um, potatoes, rice, soy, wheat. And then we get into um, other uh, seafood. So um, uh, general invertebrates, large pelagics. This would be things like our um, tunas and our swordfish, things of, of that nature. And then whitefish, whitefish are gonna be things like our cod, haddock, um, uh, that kind of stuff. And so, um, so depending on what we're eating, if we're eating you know, large pelagics or we're eating uh, mollusks and we're eating oysters and things like that, we can actually be um, having lower carbon emissions than on some plant-based diets. Regardless, they're, they're, uh, they can be similar. Um, they can also be, bad um and you'll we'll note in particular things like and so obviously the, these these all have a huge range right or most of these have a pretty huge range so that some are some could be bad some could be quite good but note that the catfish um uh of all of the of all the seafood with the possible exception of shrimp which is also um oftentimes farmed um that guy's really high, right? Everybody else sort of goes quite potentially quite low, except for catfish. The catfish is very uh, energy intensive, um, and uh, and and so therefore it has relatively high uh, carbon emissions. Cool. 
Um, so we talk about, uh, to, again, to wrap up this terrestrial versus marine stuff, um, uh, generally speaking, um, random, if we just pick some sort of random livestock production, that's going to usually need less energy than uh, most typical intensive aquaculture. So not the kind of aquaculture where people dropped off um, oysters in the estuary, but the type of active mariculture um, that we were not able to see on our trip because the abalone farm shut down in COVID. Um, but uh, things like these tilapia production facilities, commercial scale, scale tilapia production facilities, things like um, uh, catfish production facilities, et cetera, uh, do tend to use a lot of energy. And, and as I say right there, farm catfish, shrimp, and tilapia use the most. And, and that impact is primarily coming from the fact that in a commercial set, if you're just growing a couple in your backyard or in a pond for sustenance, you don't need to do a whole lot. But if we're doing commercial scale production, we're trying to supply, mar you know, consistently supply markets or whatever, we have a, a certain abundance that we want to be producing. Uh, and so that's going to mean typically a lot of electrical pumping um, and a lot of, uh, you know, running of water and moving of water masses. And so that you, uh, of course, we could theoretically have solar panels or a wind turbine and, and get our electricity that way, which would be, you know, carbon neutral, essentially, or close to carbon neutral. Um, but the default uh, production facility is not set up that way. So so we're talking about traditional energy sources here to run circulation pumps. Um, catfish is similar to beef production in the U.S. in terms of the greenhouse gases per, per kilogram of, of, of food that we've produced. So, um, so beef is relatively high and catfish is relatively high. So as with everything, there are exceptions. So even though generally speaking, you know, uh, we have lower emissions with seafood, not all seafood items have low emissions. So, so to summarize all that, I'd say the best choice, if you were trying to choose, not that you have to do this, but if you were interested in choosing a low carbon food, low carbon protein, um, things like uh, uh, those small schooling, relatively highly abundant fishes uh, in our coastal waters, like anchovies, like sardines, et cetera. Um, Farmed mollusks, so that's going to be our uh, oysters, our mussels, um, oysters, scallops, um, and then uh, the fish that are also quite abundant. We get from places like Alaska primarily, um, which are these cod and haddock-like fish um, that are relatively well um, uh, farmed and or sorry, relative, relatively well managed. Um, these are these are wild caught. These are not farms. These are wild caught species. And then um, farmed salmon um, can be quite good, depending on which which supplier we use. And then uh, and and chicken. So that so that sort of rounds out. If you if you wanted to have sort of a, a meat based diet, but we're we're shooting for lower carbon emissions, those are some starters for you. Okay. Questions so far? Questions about any of that? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so, so, right, so, so there is a proposal for, um, uh, for the folks in Ventura Harbor, or, or, how should I say this, folks associated with Ventura Harbor to be supporting an offshore um, culturing facility uh, in, in, in offshore waters. Um, so not, not tight in, not in the harbor, but, you know, out, out in the open water, out in the open ocean. Um, it's still going forward. Uh, I, we've not talked about it because it's sort of continually evolving. It also, uh, I should be careful here what I say. So I, I don't know fully, but some of the criticisms about that project are that this is a, essentially a way to secure additional money for the dredging of the harbor. So, the, so we have to dredge a lot of our harbors uh, frequently. Some like the Santa Barbara Harbor are continuously dredged. We continuously have a, a a sand sucker there and just sort of running all the time or essentially all the time um, to keep the, the uh, port, the harbor there from sedimenting in and boats not, not being able to come in and out. 
Um, in other cases, we do this episodic dredging where we come in every so often and, and one, dredge out the harbor and two, dump the sand on nearby beaches to nourish the beaches. Um, and you guys can take Dr. Patch's uh, physical oceanography class if you're curious about that more. But, but um, um, one of the just, there's been some new rules as to how you get, so the, it used to be able to, we get money every year, every couple of years from a, a government, a federal appropriations bill. U.S. Army Corps of Engineers sort of heads up all that kind of stuff that has to do with, with ports and harbors. Um, and, but in recent years, it's, take, it's gotten, as with everything else with Congress, things have gotten bogged down. It's going slower and slower and slower. And it's harder and harder and harder. So one of the reasons that that project was, it sounds like was initially conceptualized was simply how can we get more money to keep the harbor open? And if we have more users, there's on the sort of ranking list of all the people that want to have dredging projects, you go up higher. And so Ventura was worried that, you know, historically we had a lot of sea, a lot, a lot of fisher folks in there and that on the writing on the walls, like there's fewer and fewer every year. And so the notion is if we have a mariculture thing, one, that would be a, a consistent source of seafood, which is a good thing, but two, it would sort of lock in that we'd have some amount of a fisheries production, a minimum level of fisheries production year round coming into the harbor and therefore another motivation for that. Um, so yeah, so, so but, but the actual proposal sort of continually is continually evolving. So I'm not entirely sure um, where it is. Once it settles down, I'd love to talk about it, but that, that's as much as I know about it. Good question. Other questions, Eddie? Are there studies on people that eat seafood like on a daily basis, like the effect? Like, you know, they talk about mercury. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to eat seafood once or twice a week. Is that like being kind of affected by the mercury or? No, no, we're, we're definitely affected by mercury. Absolutely. So um, it's going to depend on what fish you eat. So we've done some work with different advocacy groups and we've sampled um, mercury here uh, in our region. Um, we have actually a special tool that, that's a, a really fast auto analyzer that um, we were using for some time. We're trying to bring that back online. We, it's been offline with the pandemic, but we're probably going to try to bring that back online in January. But um, uh, essentially what we found is sharks, tilefish, and tunas are pretty much where the, were, and sword, actually the worst is swordfish, but, but sort of those, those large apex predators, those are the critters that tend to have the highest concentrations of mercury. These other things that I was talking about, the caudic, the, the caudic, oh my God, I must be tired. Uh, the, the haddock, the cod, the sardines, those kind of fish, essentially no, no mercury in those types of fish. So it's not so much that you sh should or shouldn't eat certain types of fish, but you should, you should have a look at that if you're you um, frequently consuming seafood. And uh, so consuming healthy seafood is all good for the heart and all that kind of good stuff, but, but there are some risks associated with um, fish that are in contaminated waters, and or those large predatory fish that biomagnify the, um, the mercury in um, the methylated form in, in the fats, in the, in the fish tissue fats. Cool, other questions? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about how we can support sustainable seafood and how this stuff that you guys are doing fits into supporting um, sustainable seafood. First thing to say is that, uh, that we, import, we meaning US, especially California, we meaning the US, Europe, and Japan, which make the combined make the largest consumers of seafood. And so we're all large importers of seafood. So we, we have a greater demand for seafood than we can meet with our local waters, even, even if we were like full on, you know, fishing, you know, so we're a relatively small amount of the overall population on the planet, but we consume a disproportionately large amount of the seafood supply, particularly the, the higher end seafood, the more expensive types of seafood. Um, so uh, first, the first thing you can do is to purchase seafood from a robust 
country, democracy, transparency laws, all that kind of stuff. And so again, that's going to be um, the US, show you a couple different countries in a second, but that's going to be um, countries that are interested in collecting data, actively collecting data about their fish stocks, actively trying to, um, uh, you know, to, to innovate and use different methods uh, to, to recover speed. If, if a population is, is um, okay, make sure it stays okay. If it's overexploited, if it's, if it's been hammered, to allow it to, to recover, et cetera. In the US, some of the key laws, for example, are the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, which we actually didn't talk about this semester very much. I'm happy to talk about it more, but um, some years I, I go into detail on that. But, but suffice it to say, that's our, that's our main federal fisheries act. Um, the Endangered Species Act, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, all these things have, have some impact in terms of our fisheries. The biggest one, though, at the national scale is going to be the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and specifically the division within NOAA that handles um, seafood and fisheries, which is the National Marine Fisheries Service. So everybody calls this NIMFS as if there's an I in there. So National Marine Fisheries Service, NIMFS. A couple of years ago, they decided that was too weird a word and they wanted a simpler word. So they started calling this division within NOAA, NOAA Fisheries. And it, as with other changes when we've been doing things for decades and decades, it sort of didn't really take and we're kind of now back to using the term NIMFS. Um, so you might see NOAA Fisheries or National Marine Fisheries Service, same, same entity. Um, and so that's the, that's the group that, that collects all our data. That's the group that does the sort of you know, calculations for stocks and how are, how, are, how are things going. And in recent years, they've really taken a big push for so-called ecosystem-based um, um, management or EBM. This is different than the traditional fisheries that we've fisheries management that we've traditionally been reading about and the examples we've seen, which are, oh my gosh, abalone. We got to manage abalone. How many abalone are we going to take out of the ground? Because we want to figure out how many abalone we'll have next week because we want to know how much abalone, right? It's all about this, this species, the species of this individual stock, 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 stock. The, the idea with ecosystem-based management is, yeah, you know, we want to know how many abalone we're sucking out of the ocean and, and right, all that. But to properly manage this, this critter, this critter is a part of its ecosystem. And so simply only modeling what, you know, the numbers of the abundance of this organism over time, that's not going to do it, right? Because this abalone has impacts on other things, maybe sea otters, maybe, maybe urchins or, you know, whatever. And those things are going to have impact. So, so it's, it's more of a holistic management approach. So rather than just use um, a, a sort of reductionist, what we historically call a reductionist approach, it's more of an integrative ecological types of types of an approach. Um, very easy to say, harder to actually implement in the real world, but nevertheless, that's a, that's a big push in the last about 20 years with, within NIMPS. Um, and then another thing that has come out of the Magnuson-Stevenson Act and, and, the, and the reappropriation of it over, over the years uh, is this notion of regional fisheries management councils. So rather than one, um, one office in, I don't know, DC or something managing all the fish stocks, we have these regional councils. And while they have representatives from NOAA, they also have representatives from industry, both the, the sort of fisherman type part of the industry, as well as the seafood producer type elements of the seafood industry, um, academics like you and me, environmental groups, um, et cetera. And so um, uh, are we perfect? No. Do we screw up things? Of course. Uh, uh, you know, do we have problematic stocks? Of course. We've talked about, uh, you know, sardine crashes and um and you guys have read about uh the cod atlantic cod off the east coast right i mean we can talk about all these examples but we're we have structures in place to hopefully not let that happen right and so even though we might screw up we at least have this institutional framework 
to do it. So technically speaking, technically speaking, it's illegal. It's it's illegal to overfish a fish stock in the U, in U.S. waters by all these laws, right? We still do it, but but at least we're starting from this framework of this is not the right way to behave. Uh, another key part of that. So one is to choose. You know, the first step is to choose seafood from a, a country that has relatively robust laws and enforcement and, and those mechanisms. Next, this, this traceability idea of country of origin labeling or cool laws. Um, and we have those here. Um, these, were, these were passed, uh, these were crafted starting in the 90s and then sort of came to pass basically in the early 2000s. Um, and as I mentioned to some of you before, uh, uh, seafood is the least powerful of the lobbies um, there uh, in terms of in terms of agricultural policy in Congress. So, so the poultry industry got exemptions, the beef industry got exemptions, everybody got exemptions except for seafood. So even though seafood is a relatively um, smaller amount in terms of gross biomass and, and total profits, um, they were the first sector that had to apply country of origin labeling laws in the US. Um, and then in 2008, there was a modification to that law that, that um, allows us to say something is a product of the USA if the <clears throat> seafood was landed in the USA. So we talked about the, um, the calamari, right? We talked about the market squid that, you know, which is one of, one of our largest fisheries here in California. We catch all these squid, flash freeze them for the most part, throw them on long haul freighters that go over to China, take them off the boat, thaw them out, uh, 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 you know, gut them and prep them and clean them and then package them up and then refreeze them, put them back on other car long haul cargo ship and ship them back over to us. And those are all labeled product of the USA, right? Even though they've gone, have a much larger embodied carbon emission spectrum and all that stuff. Um, uh, so anyway, so yeah, so, so, but country of origin of labeling or just origin of labeling, very helpful in terms of helping you decide if this is something I should do. So first and foremost, USA or the democracies to look at the country of origin labeling. And then we can talk about, um, uh, again, this idea of which countries are better, which countries are, should we support, which countries should we avoid. Um, and as with everything, there are bad decisions within the good bin, and there are some good decisions within the bad bin. But so we're talking generalities here as sort of the first principle approach to, to making more sustainable seafood choices. And so, um, so this is a paper from a couple of years ago now, so the data is a little bit old, but um, I, it's still pretty, I, I don't think things have changed massively in the last few years here. Um, and so this was a paper in 2016 by uh, a few guys that were um, trying to look at at these other aspects we're talking about, not just only the abundance of the fish stock, but, but are we doing the research to understand? Many of our fisheries are so-called data poor fisheries, meaning we don't know enough about the stock abundance. We don't know enough about the life history. So there's lots of questions we need to understand for us to best manage them, right? And so research is a key part of that, right? That could be something you guys do as a senior thesis. It could be something somebody does as a master's thesis, whatever could be a government scientist in a lab somewhere, but we, we need more knowledge for these, um, these sort of hidden populations out underneath the waves. <clears throat> and so what you see here is you see here, the countries are graded from the right being um, uh, on average really uh, solid and then going to the left to zero being the least um, robust and, and, and the least uh, healthy. And so the, the top list there, it would be USA, Iceland, Norway, Russia, and New Zealand. The worst fisheries would be uh, the Philippines, Bangladesh, China, Brazil, Thailand, and Myanmar. And I should, be, I should say here, I'm referring specifically to the waters of these countries, right? So there are, there are you know, whatever, Icelandic uh, fishermen that might go down to Antarctica, right? But, but I'm, we're talking here about the, the, the fish stocks in their countries. So when it says a product of this country, it's landed in that country. Um, 
So cool. So the question is, so do you, so we've actually, you guys have collected data on this, this year. So um, I have a graph right here. I'll show you the answers for your earlier public opinion polling data and, and your, your predecessors for the last several years. But what do you guys think? So do you think, so this is the question when we ask folks saying, hey, do you think it's relatively, I mean, it's not exactly the same question, but it, it overlaps, which is, do you think it's safe to eat seafood from these different countries, right? And if you remember, we asked about places like Thailand, Norway, um, uh, California, right? So, uh, so I'll give you guys, uh, I don't know, give you guys two minutes. So get in groups of two, three, and you guys act, say if you think or make your arguments as to whether you think that our data tracks with this data from 2016 or or not the, the in other words our local public perception is, it, is this what people think is this what joe blow thinks in santa barbara ventura la county so you might need to stand you might need to sit up and and scooch over a few few feet to say hi to someone Oh, sorry. Okay, all right, so what do you guys think? What do you guys think? Do people generally generally track with this? Do, do, do the public think this way or do they think uh, unrelated to this broad pattern? Okay, so I gotta vote for unrelated. So, right, so we specifically asked Thailand down here, China down here, right? So we specifically asked about two of these in the relatively, um, uh, you know, not, not 
the best managed um, examples. We asked about Norway, and then we have obviously examples in the US, Alaska, California, so uh, we asked about Norway. Um, we, uh, what else did we ask about? Oh, Gulf of Mexico, or Gulf of Mexico, what did you say? Yeah, oh, that's right, thank you, Japan. So Japan, which is sort of midway in here. Um, uh, and I should say, this isn't all the countries of the world, right? These are just sort of seafood producer countries, uh, the like sort of top seafood producers. Um, okay, so let's see what the answer is. Oh, look at that graph, what? Okay, so um, this is over time. So this is the average and the standard error. And uh, so the lowest consistently year over year uh, and okay, sorry, let me explain this. So I, 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 I standard, I, I've done a relative scale here. So positive means that people thought it was safe to eat, right? Negative means people thought it wasn't safe to eat. If they were neutral, if they were uh, like Suzanne and, and Michelle, and people were saying like, ah, oh, people don't like so, so much care. They're just neutral or it's, you know, it's, it's 50, about 50% up, 50% down, that kind of thing. That would, that would mean they would fall out on the zero line. And so your data is all right here with the errors. Um, and so, because we didn't ask this question last year because of the pandemic uh, uh, issues, um, there's, it's, it, the, the line's a broken line here. But, um, and, and also I should say that we didn't always start asking all these, we sort of added some of these questions or these categories after the fact. The most classic one would be this little pink triangle of Orange County, which we, did not separate from the rest of California until this year with the oil spill. We're curious how that worked out. But okay, so here we go. So here's China, right? Low, most people don't think it's particularly safe, right? Um, uh, I don't know which one I wanna say is next, but we can start with uh, the Gulf of Mexico, right? So this, we start asking this in the wake of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And so back then people were like, yep, nope, ain't safe to eat that, you know, seafood from that, oily part of the world. And so it slowly climbed up, it took about five years or so, but now it's, it's, it's relatively stable, right? And so now most people would say, yeah, it's, it's not as, as viewed as positively as say Alaska, this blue one up here, but nevertheless it is positive and it's, it hasn't changed much after that recovery period. Okay, Japan, Japan was in the middle, right? Remember of that, of that ranking? And so starting off again, started asking this question in the wake of the Fukushima uh, disaster. So obviously, again, a lot of press, a lot of concern, a lot of worry in this case about radiation, not oil, but radiation. And so we start off and it's relatively low and it takes about seven years or so to recover, but it, it's maybe sort of stabilizing now, right? In the last couple of years, it's, it's been in the, always been in the positive uh, range. Um, we could talk about Norway, which is a relatively high one, right? Norway was one that is, is pretty well up there. And Norway has been pretty solid. So here's, it hasn't really changed much for year, from year to year to year. So on average, you guys might be, you guys are right. A lot of people are like, I don't know, but of the people that have an opinion, we seem to do a fairly good job of tracking this, this um, you know, much more in-depth research in terms of research and and, and health of stocks and things of that nature. And then just to round it out, because we're here, again, that graph I showed you wasn't broken down in sub areas, but obviously Alaska has a very high rating and that's, that's crafted, um, one, because the fisheries are well-managed, but two, because of a very, very active PR campaign to trick, not tricky, that's not right, third thing to say, to convince you that Alaska is pristine and clean and everything that comes from us is pristine and clean. And so we are pristine and clean. And we're, we're crisp and fresh and healthy. Um, don't worry about that copper mine and all that kind of stuff. But, but so, so, um, so that's relatively, uh, so consistently people think that Alaska seafood is safe, good for you, et cetera. California overall, again, initially we just asked about California. We didn't break it down until the 2015 refugio oil spill, this dotted one, where we started asking specifically about seafood from the Santa Barbara Channel, so Ventura and Santa Barbara County seafood. And that started off with a dip and then recovered and has pretty much been okay, although it has gone a little bit down the last couple of years. 
and then um, and then again this year we we started asking about Orange County and Orange County was is lower than that because re recall we started in the survey right in the wake of the of the oil spill. Um, so yeah, so there you go. So generally speaking, I would say that 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 does a fairly good job of tracking this this uh, um, much more rigorous academic um, stab. Cool. Okay. Um, continuing on, uh, questions about that? Make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. So then uh, continuing on this idea of, of being uh, actively supporting sustainable seafood and all that good stuff. Um, generally speaking, uh, shellfish are gonna be pretty solid options if you wanted to have a, a, a low carbon diet and relatively, you know, not super impactful diet. It's things like oysters, mussels, and clams are gonna be the thing to go. And this is another uh, visualization from a more recent paper but looking at the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions relative to the nutrient density of these foods. And so um, over, over here in the green are, I should say over here, over, I should stand here. Over here in the green are, are plants and fungus, the green colors, the, the sort of uh, avocado colored guys. And then the capture fisheries are up here um, small pelagics, again, those sardines and, and anchovies and those kind of things, those guys come out really pretty low and only, um, only roots do better than um, small pelagics in this uh, assessment, this analysis. Um, okay, as we mentioned uh, last time, the, the I, number next would be to, to understand and use some of these guides, certifications and guides, right? Again, um, you can become an expert on this, which would be totally cool and a, a great thing to do. All kinds of jobs uh, available for folks that are interested in doing this kind of green accounting and, and, and that type of an approach to um, sustainability. But, you know, most of us aren't going to become the world's expert on squid or what have you, right? So, so take advantage of these um, tools that are really trying to get do the hard work for you and have the experts dig in um, you know so you don't you don't necessarily have to spend weeks and weeks and weeks digging into stuff and so again the we have the green guides and the certifications the green guides are something you can use as a recommendation right whereas the certification is a seal of approval a third party or, or what have you um, actually going out there and um, saying yes this is cool uh, We've talked about uh, the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, on the left on your screen. Um, there are uh, a, a few other certifications. There's actually several. There's lots of stuff actually in California, but um, they sometimes tend to be fairly niche and very, very um, kind of idiosyncratic. But I'd say that the broadest ones in terms of the certifications are going to be the Marine Stewardship Council. The Aquaculture Stewardship Council, which is essentially the aquaculture version of MSC, and then Best Aquaculture Practices, which um, uh, tries to encourage all kinds of good stuff, including um, social utility and things of that nature in their, uh, in their guidance. Um, then number next you can do is, is support uh, local reliable seafood suppliers. Um, and you can, uh, I would encourage you all to uh, go check out their seafood sourcing policy. Again, I, I wouldn't expect you to all become experts on this and, and spend weeks and weeks, but they should all have a policy. If somebody's trying to be responsible, they should have a state of policy. These are our goals. These are how we get seafood, et cetera. Um, and uh, so look at their policy. And a key aspect of this, as we've touched on, has to be traceability. We have to know that when this, somebody says this is salmon, we have to know that it really is salmon. When this something says it's 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 big eyed tuna, is it really big eyed tuna, or is it yellowfin tuna, or you know that kind of stuff? So as long as we can trace it, and, and what uh, what policy do these food providers have? And it turns out that um, so one of the big controversies uh, a couple of years ago was um, Walmart, and when Walmart started getting into uh, or getting initially expressing interest in getting into sustainable seafood, a lot of people are like, wait, what? It's, they're not granola or crunchy. Like, wait, they can't do that. And 
you know, it's like, why not? Like, well, because they're Walmart and they're like evil by definition, right? And it's like, hey, if we're trying to move the ball forward, we're trying to get everybody to behave better. It's a win to get one of these big, large industrial purveyors um, to to exert better social responsibility and, and sustainability and stuff. Um, turns out the, there's a lot of people pushing for, and I'm not trying to pick on Walmart, but they just stick in my head for some reason today. Um, uh, what persuade what, what ultimately was was super helpful in persuading Walmart was not that we don't want to screw the planet over was not climate change was not any of that it was it turns out that poorly managed fisheries are crap for business shocker right so when we're we're raping and pillaging and crashing the numbers down that works well for a couple years And so maybe if you're a mom and pop shop or over here, maybe you're not gonna sell shrimp anymore because the shrimp's gone, right? But if you're Walmart that plans out their supply chains for years in advance, right? And wants to lock people that supply them into these long-term contracts, it turns out that, that having their suppliers use sustainably harvested, well-managed seafood supplies is actually good for the bottom line, right? Because you know that you can, you're gonna have X number of pounds of, shrimp or whatever, right? So they originally brought into it for a business reason. And obviously I, I wouldn't say they don't, they don't care about climate change and that stuff, but, but the original initial hook was just, you know, reliance, reliability, consistency, which is what their, their corp, corporation is built on. Okay. Uh, and I would say in our, in our area, um, a few examples, I'm not trying to exclude anybody, but just some examples of folks that have um, a pretty, pretty robust um, either pretty darn good or getting better a lot very fast would be um, Costco, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, Albertsons, Kroger's. One of the best suppliers around is going to be Santa Monica Seafoods. Although you typically don't, they, they do have a store, they have a couple stores, but, but they, you don't usually see them, but they supply seafood to restaurants and other, and other markets and stuff. Um, so they're, they're um, a fantastic uh, leader in trying to be more transparent. And when they deliver their seafood to the restaurants, they all get a guide. They might not use it, but there's a guide that says where the fish came from, how well it's managed, um, um, all that kind of stuff. So, so anybody that gets Santa Monica Seafoods fish um, should be able to answer all your questions on, that, on our, our survey, right? Where does it come from? What's the species, right? they might not choose to go look it up, but it is available to them um, at, at, for all their suppliers. It's not, it's not a paid service. They just do it for all or the vast majority of their um, fish supplies. Okay. Um, yeah. And so then ultimately, then the last little bit is just to ask, right? So, so those sort of general principles, you know, so purchase seafood from a, a, a robust country with enforcement and all this and that. And, Oh, well, but ultimately it's about you guys asking. So when you're doing these surveys, again, you are helping uh, move the ball uh, forward in terms of getting us to think more about sustainability and, and seafood stuff. And with that, I think it's time for a break. I'm gonna take a 10 minute break. I will see you guys back here in 10 minutes. What time do I have? I have, I have 9.03, so we'll start at 9.13. Do, 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 do